Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The two attacks in the town of Hanahim, which is 180 kilometers northeast of Baghdad, targeted two Shi'i mosques and left 62 dead and 95 injured. The report stated that the two mosques were located in an old area, and that there were about 500 people praying there during the time of the suicide operation, and that the number of casualties is predicted to reach 100. Meanwhile, at least six people were killed and about 40 others injured due to the suicide bombing operation of two booby-trapped cars near the Jazaria detention center in southern Baghdad this morning. Once again, violence overshadows Iraq, this time due to the suicide attacks with the explosion of two booby-trapped cars. There are mixed reports of what the attacks targeted. The first story, according to the American military and an official from the Secretary of State, the attacks targeted Alhamra Hotel for foreigners stays as well as some journalists. The other story points to the attempts of the attackers to target the Interior Ministry at Jazeera Detention Center that has been the focus of news reports on the detainees abuse scandal. The operation created lots of destruction, mainly to homes and housing complexes, and left many victims killed or injured, and dozens of cars damaged. We were in our house when we first heard the explosion. The second explosion was strong. When it happened, it destroyed all the houses that were around us, and left many martyred and injured, among them children. I pulled the children out of the destruction with my own hands. I saw a girl that was 14 years old, and I pulled her out with my own hands. According to experts in criminal investigation, the tremendous explosions was caused by a large amount of explosives, which was obvious at the site of the destruction and the damage done to the buildings. Rescue teams used all means to pull out the victims trapped under the rubble using American machinery. We rescued an Arab man from Sudan, but there was another Arab man from Sudan who died. We also rescued the family of a doctor and found a woman and her daughter under the rubble of a demolished home. They both passed away. May God have mercy on them. These attacks came in the shadow of an angry political atmosphere among the people in the country, a matter that is feared to leave behind negative effects on the security situation, especially with the nearing of the parliamentary elections. The tremendous explosions transformed this area into a pile of rubble. As always, innocent civilians paid the higher price of material and human losses. Thus, the series of violence in Iraq continues in the most extreme levels. Hossein Abdul Wahab, Abu Dhabi Television, from the site of the explosion, Baghdad. Today, 74 people were martyred and 75 others were injured in two similar terrorist explosions at two mosques in the village of Hanahin. Criminal terrorists exploded two booby-trapped cars in the area of Karada, killing five citizens, including two children, and injuring more than 40 others. These scenes need no commentary. They show the results from the explosions of two booby-trapped cars from a terrorist attack in the area of Karada. The explosion killed and wounded innocent civilians, collapsed residential buildings, and damaged a large number of civilian cars. What did we do wrong? Why is this happening to us? Why are they targeting our homes and our children?
May God punish them for the sake of Prophet Muhammad. The explosion went off and everything fell on our heads. Everything has fallen to the ground. We all decided to get out. I got hit on my head. The civilians who were wounded in this incident say that this terrorist attack targets the Iraqi people and tries to shake the security and stability of this country. These are terrorists. First, this is a residential area. There are no military important sites here to explode. These explosions are killing innocent people. They killed children and impoverished people. They blew up their homes and cars and all the cars were damaged. I was next to the window and I heard the first explosion. Then I felt that my face was full of blood. I ran to my mom, she was alone in the house. I pushed her to get inside because I was afraid that another car outside would explode. There are no military commands here, it is a civilian area. There is nothing here, only homes. I just removed two children and their mother from the rubble with my own hands. In my own home, my wife and daughter were injured. The entire house was destroyed. What did we do to deserve this? The Iraqi security forces emergency teams, civilian defense forces, and first aid ambulances were present at the site of the explosion to remove the bodies of the martyred and transport the injured, and provide medical assistance in addition to pulling up the rubble. Early this morning we were on patrol inside of the Karada area. When we heard the explosion we headed towards the site of the incident. We checked and secured the area. We counted the civilians and helped the families. We pulled some people out from underneath the rubble. We found that a number of civilian cars belonging to the residents had been damaged, at least 60 cars. The homes and rental buildings have been damaged also. Our soldiers are cleaning up and removing the rubble within the area. There were two explosions from two booby-trapped cars. We came and saw a horrible scene. All the people were wounded and injured. We found some people were buried under the rubble, still alive. We got a call from the first aid ambulance telling us to go to the explosion site. We transported the injured. We found some people injured and killed underneath the rubble. In the face of this horrible crime, these citizens confirm that this terrorist act does not deter their unity. They insist on working together for the sake of building a new Iraq. Targeting innocent civilians in this horrific way confirms the crimes of the terrorists and their frustrated attempt to obstruct the political process, which will reach its peak in the upcoming parliamentary election in mid-December. From the site of the explosion, Hamid al-Atabi, Iraqiya, Baghdad. The Supreme Court in Uzbekistan sentenced 15 people up to 20 years in jail. They are charged for being involved in the Andijan incidents and accused of killing 200 army forces and policemen, according to the official report. Human rights organizations question the validity of the sentence, and some believe that this ruling reveals that the dictatorial regime in Tashkent, which is loyal to Russia, fears coming uprising in a state where 80% of the population is Muslim. Hundreds of people were killed during the uprisings in Andijan six months ago, so that the world could see the true colors of the Republic of Uzbekistan in Central Asia. 80% of the population follows Islam, and they continue to suffer under a dictatorship whose ideology and forces are officially drawn from Russia and, to a lesser extent, the king. By sentencing those who are involved in the uprising with the most severe punishment, the Tashkent regime has tried to teach a lesson to anyone who dares to seek a better life.
الكريم. They beat him. لقد حكموا عليه بالسجن. They sentenced him to seven years in prison. Every day they beat him. I don't know how he's doing. There are many mothers like her and also many people like her son. Some people escaped the country to get away from being pursued by the brutal security agencies while others are still awaiting their fate. There is no other way to protect them. There is no other way to protect them unless they contact the immigration administration. Only then can we register and legally protect them so that we can take them back to Uzbekistan. The revolutionaries who seek bread, water, and job opportunities are portrayed by the government as people who want to overthrow the government and turn it into an Islamic Sharia state. The revolutionaries are not the only ones being pursued by the security agencies, but independent journalists as well. The district attorney accused me of being aware of the uprising when I reported that 4,000 armed people may be prepared to carry out an armed revolution. President Arsalan Karimov, who covers the country with steel and fire, tries to use the Islamic Shura Council in Uzbekistan to his advantage to neutralize the activities of armed Islamic groups that are active in surrounding countries. Our preachers take all the opportunities to explain the difference between true Islam and terrorism in schools, mosques, and in the media. They try their best to explain the relationship between the council and the government. Perhaps few people in Uzbekistan understand this relationship. Islam, whose root go back centuries in the region, has today become a very strange thing. Although the prayers are established in the mosques, whose histories also trace back to the time of Islamic expansion, just like this copy of the Quran, which is one of the main attractions for tourists. For the third consecutive day, the prisoners in the central Damascus jail continued their hunger strike, protesting the oppression and pressures being placed on Syria. A hunger strike was held by prisoners in the central Damascus jail in solidarity with the nation. This may seem a bit strange, but the truth behind what's happening was revealed during our visit. As most of the prisoners participated in the hunger strike, the jail did not look like a prison anymore. We are all in for different crimes. Each one of us did something wrong. Therefore, we are not waiting for any sort of reward or for a change in our living situation that we have because it is already positive. We are part of this society, we live in it and we are involved in its issues and we see what is happening abroad. Their feeling of brotherhood had more meaning than their past mistakes, provoking them to express their rejection of pressures and the threats being made against Syria. They could not find any way to express themselves except through holding a hunger strike. We decided to hold a hunger strike four or five days ago to reject the imperial and western pressures being placed on Syria. What was surprising is the fact that some friendly nations were helpless in taking a positive position towards Syria. I felt that something is going to harm my family and my nation. It is something that I cannot stay silent about. All Syrian people will not remain silent. Despite the known relationship between prisoners and the prison administration, it can be said that the nation's freedom is much more important. We are responsible for the security of these prisoners. They are being detained for different crimes. They express their opinions through a hunger strike to join with the Syrian public in rejecting the continued pressures and threats on the nation. With empty stomachs for the fourth day, they insisted on having their voices heard. Here, in this way, these prisoners wanted to express their love for their country. When the homeland is threatened, all other things become trivial. All citizens are united, including those who made mistakes and those who did not. Everybody mobilizes in the name of the homeland. For the homeland's sake, all trivial matters are put aside, so that the flag will always wave high in everybody's heart. 
Without the flag, nothing would ever have any value from the central Damascus jail. Before ending his four-day visit to Lebanon, UN Undersecretary General for Political Affairs Ibrahim Gambari met yesterday with MP Bahia Hariri in the Majd al -Yun. And also in southern Lebanon, Gambari, joined by the UN Secretary General Representative for Southern Lebanon, Gil Peterson, visited the UNIFIL post in Naura, which monitors the blue line that traces the Lebanese-Israeli border. Yumna Tayyara has the story. While in South Lebanon, where he visited the UNIFIL post, UN Undersecretary General Ibrahim Gambari met with MP Bahia Hariri in Majd al -Yun. MP Hariri expressed her views on various regional issues. The highlights of their discussions revolved around the investigation and the assassination of former Premier Rafik Hariri and Lebanese-Palestinian relations. Gambari evaluated with Hariri meetings he led while in Lebanon and reiterated the international community's determination to reveal the truth in the assassination of her late brother. MP Hariri expressed to the UN official her full support regarding the steps taken by the UN and praised the cooperation it was getting from the Lebanese government. MP Hariri stressed that Lebanon's stability was related to revealing the truth and that all Lebanese were united for the same cause. For his part, Gambari promised to deliver all of MP Hariri's appeals to UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, assuring that the UN had complete trust in Detlev Melis's investigating team. Gambari added that no one could kill what Lebanon represented, and said when the country would unite, it would be able to face challenges and would step into economic prosperity. The UN official's last stop in Lebanon, joined by the representative of the UN Secretary General for South Lebanon, Geir Peterson, was the Naura Unifil Post, where he met with Commander Major General Alain Pellegrini, his political advisor and high-ranking officers in the force. The international program to fight child labor organized a two-day workshop revolving around the different solutions present in, to elim eliminate child labor and recent study showed that around 13 million children worked in Arab countries. The conference started yesterday at the Bristol Hotel in Beirut and was put in order between the labor ministry and the international labor organization. Labor Minister Tarad Hamede was among the speakers at the international program to fight child labor workshop. Hamede assured that it was the government's responsibility to fight child labor and stressed that every child had the right for an education. The president of the General Labor Confederation, Rassan Ghusun, explained that the main cause behind child labor was the low income earned by many parents who were unable to offer education to their children, a fact which drove many children to seek work on the streets. Rosen added that the government, the people and civil society should all work towards fighting poverty, as it turned out to be the main problem behind child labor. In an attempt to counter this crisis and allow children to express their concerns and views, the Higher Council for Childhood inaugurated the meeting for the Arab Child Parliament. In her speech, the director of the Family and Childhood Department at the Arab League, Mona Kamel, said that the Arab League Secretary General was seeking to include an article on the agenda of the coming Arab summit pertaining to the creation of such a parliament. At the end of the two-day workshop, participants were expected to raise a series of proposals regarding the opening of the Arab Child Parliament. An Israeli military court found an army sergeant not guilty of all charges in the death probe of Iman al-Homs, a Palestinian child killed in cold blood in the Rafah refugee camp on May 2004. The court's rulings caught the girl's family off guard. Palestinian legal experts criticized the court's findings. They called it manifestation for the justification of Israeli murders. Imam al Hamas is a 13-year-old girl assassinated by the bullets of the Israeli occupation while on her way to school in the Rafah refugee camp approximately one year and a half ago. She was brutally and deliberately murdered by an Israeli soldier. Her story came back in focus as an Israeli military court found the army sergeant who was accused of killing her innocent of wrongdoing. 
The perpetrator did not only kill the girl, but also emptied his gun, firing 20 rounds in her pure and tiny body. Members of the girl's family were dismayed and outraged by the ruling. They called on the international community to serve them the justice they deserve. We expected and hoped that the Israeli court would have ruled in favor of Iman because she was a child. We were almost positive that the soldier would be indicted. But after the soldier received an honor for his performance and bravery, we knew that the court would rule in favor of the soldier. It was a shock and justice did not prevail. However, we expected the court to rule in favor of the soldier. As a mother of this child, I call on the international community to serve us justice we and Iman deserve. The father of the girl visited her gravesite and laid some flowers in her tomb. When asked about the court ruling, he could not control his emotions and broke out crying. Everything has a spirit, including the legal system. Where is the spirit of the Israeli judicial system? Oh God, help us. God is our only savior. The Palestinian Human Rights Center was not surprised by the court ruling. The Israeli judicial system has been known for manipulating murder probes and criminal acts against Palestinians in order to legitimize and justify them. The Israeli judicial system and the International Justice Court of The Hague have given legal immunity to Israelis committing murders and criminal acts against Palestinian civilians in the occupied territories. It should be mentioned that the girl's killer is an army surgeon from northern Israel. His name was withheld by Israel for his safety. This is not the first time the Israeli occupation has killed a Palestinian child, but it is the most high-profile case because the girl was killed deliberately and in cold blood. And the court ruling of finding the suspect not guilty of all charges is not the first of its kind. What is repulsive and outrageous is that the killer was honored for his bravery and a job well done. Hazen Badaru, Abu Dhabi Channel, Gaza. The Knesset elections will take place between the end of February and the end of March. That was the word from Labour Party Chairman Amir Paris this morning as he emerged from his meeting with Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. The two met at Sharon's Tel Aviv bureau to discuss an agreed date for the next elections. This one day after Sharon said he wants the polling to be held as soon as possible and does not, quote, want to waste time on a lengthy campaign. Peretz described his talks with the Prime Minister as businesslike and said he would agree to any date Sharon chose. The Labour leader added he hopes the final date will be announced before Monday when a bill to dissolve the Knesset will be brought to the House for its preliminary reading. The Prime Minister has yet to inform the Likud whether he will lead them in the next elections or set up a new centrist party. Prime Minister Sharon also met today with Shinoi leader Yosef Tami Lapid. Sharon told Lapid that he intends convening the Likud Knesset faction in the next few days to unveil his diplomatic plans. Plans, said Sharon, that will be based on the roadmap peace proposal. Knesset member Lapid said that his party will support holding elections in March. Well, joining us now on the telephone from Likud headquarters in Tel Aviv, where the Likud secretariat is meeting, is Jerusalem Post political affairs correspondent Gil Hoffman. Gil, hi. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Gil, how is the Likud reacting to news that the elections will be in March at the latest? Well, I think that there's a fervor over here. Everyone's very excited about the elections, but there is also anger here among the Likud secretariat members who are convened actually in, the, in Tel Aviv's Beta Chayal. Uh, they're saying Sharon has to decide immediately whether he's staying inside the Likud. Uh, they're not going to tolerate uh, waiting until at least Monday, as Sharon said today to Tommy Lapid. Uh, they want to know what, whether Sharon is their leader, and if not, they want him to leave immediately. And what's Sharon's next move then? <laughs> uh, Sharon uh, doesn't want to make any decision uh, until the last minute. Uh, Sharon wants to keep all the cards close to his chest, and that means... Uh, that we won't know uh, even uh, until uh, a few minutes before the Knesset has it, uh, passed the bill to dissolve the Knesset what party Sharon is going to be. 
Gil, is there anyone in Likud who stands to lose from early elections? Uh, well, uh, there's a possibility that Netanyahu would lose from early elections. He did say that he favors holding elections uh, in May or June, and he said that the reason was was that he wants to make sure uh, that uh, support for Amir Peretz, uh, that right now is at its peak, erodes. Uh, and there are Sharon people who said that Netanyahu needs that time, the stall time, to make sure that his support uh, will be able to grow again and that he needs time for that to happen. Iraq's visiting national security advisor is still in Iran who told reporters Thursday there is no evidence to prove Iran's interference in Iraqi internal affairs or its involvement in terrorist events there. Muwaffaq al rubai stressed security of Iran and Iraq is intertwined thereby, as he added, both sides respect security in the other country. al rubai meanwhile, referred to meetings he had with Iranian officials who were reassured the Iraqi government will in no way let the government turn into a base for terrorists who intend to invade Iran or any other country. Uh, Meanwhile, that, that, Iran and Iraq signed a memorandum of understanding which calls for further enforcement of security cooperation between the two neighbors. The MOU covers key issues including anti-drug fight, enhancement of security across Iraqi holy sites, where Iranians are frequented for pilgrimage. Meanwhile, senior Iraqi security official held a separate meeting with Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who said Tehran will give Baghdad an all-out backing to see the war-stricken neighbor march on the progress track. He also expressed hope that security in Iraq will pave the way for restoration of peace in that country. Iranian telecommunications and IT minister Mohammad Soleimani, currently in Tunisia to attend the World Summit on the Information Society, held separate meetings with world top officials. This is why diplomats present at the summit voiced their objections over single-handed U.S. control over the Internet and called for an international control on the global network. And Iran's Hossein Reza Zadeh lived up to his status as a world champion by snatching the gold medal in the 105 plus kilogram category World Weightlifting Championships in Doha, Qatar on Thursday. Reza Zadeh, who holds the world records in snatch, clean, and jerk, and combined, beat his Russian rival Evgeny Chikishov, who came in second. Reza Zadeh easily gained the gold medal by accomplishing a total of 461 kilos and moved ahead of Chigishov with four kilos behind and a total of 457 kilos. A weightlifter from India became third. Time now for a quick look at some other news in brief. Iranian Parliament Speaker Ghulam Ali Haddad Adel says Washington nowadays is behind the hostile and cruel actions in the name of freedom and democracy. Haddad Adel has also said the U.S. invaded Iraq on the pretext of destroying weapons of mass destruction while it is in fact after the oil in the region. Turkey scientists and university scholars attended a conference in Ankara, Turkey to put emphasis on Iran's indisputable right to make use of nuclear technology for non-civilian purposes. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedahl Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.